to what we're going to be talking about today. Today's Spark Lecture, and I'm very happy that everybody could, could, could attend today. It's just really great to, to see that so many people are interested in learning outside the classroom. But today's Spark Lecture I'm delivering on today is called The Economic Battle of the Century, Keynes versus Hayek. And this, it was interesting, when I was, trying to put my, when I was trying to put this together and thinking what I wanted to deliver on for the first Spark Lecture this year, I was thinking, I really like economics, but economics is sometimes sort of billed as the dismal science, right? You know, we talk about interest rates and growth and money, and it's all very boring and how we're going to make this interesting. And my goal here, and I'd be interested in your feedback when you leave, is let me know is, have I made interesting the ideas of Keynes versus Hayek? Because to me, this stuff is just absolutely so fascinating. And my goal, hopefully, what I'll do is be able to share a little bit of that with you um, this afternoon. So we're going to begin with this quote. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. That's a quote from John Maynard Keynes. And I thought I'd use this as an introduction because what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about two different sets of ideas from two dead old men who had these ideas basically in the 1930s, but which still influence our everyday lives, which still influence the way that, that I work, the way that your parents work, the way that your world will be when you leave school. And it's really quite interesting to reflect on this idea that these old men have had so, so much profound influence over the past century and continue to even as we move forward to the future. So who are these two people, right? We've got John Maynard Keynes. Has anybody ever heard of John Maynard Keynes before by a show of hands? Okay, so the pressure's on then if I'm going to be introducing you to John Maynard Keynes if you haven't heard of him before. Probably the most famous British economist of all time. Um, lived from 1883 to 1946. Born in Cambridge. His father was a professor. Very sort of liberal and free thinking and upper middle class. He went to Eton. And he followed on to Cambridge. And when he graduated from university, he had this real sort of bohemian lifestyle. He moved to London. He was part of the Bloomsbury Group. He was an economist, but he was very much sort of like, you know, on the free thinking fringe of the profession, right? And, you know, when, when World War I broke out, he joined the Treasury, not so much because he really wanted to be a civil servant, but because he was actually just so smart that they had to find this guy who was doing all this lecturing at Cambridge brought him into the treasury so they could help finance, essentially, uh, the British involvement with World War I. And in fact, he was so clever that when they were negotiating the peace terms with Germany at the end of World War I, he saw what was happening. He was there at the front row table of the deals, and he was so disgusted by the way that the Allies were treating the, the, the Germans, the vanquished Germans, that he, with the amount of war reparations that they were going to charge, that he, that he wrote his first really famous work which was called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, I believe published in 1918, which basically said that what we've done to the Germans with the war reparations that we've imposed upon them is essentially going to cause probably another world war. And of course, he turned out to be unfortunately um, correct in that. So we're going to contrast him. So this bit, he was also six foot six, very charismatic, very influential, very much able to sell his ideas. We're going to contrast him with this guy here. Um, his name is Frederick Hayek, probably the most important economist you've never heard of. A bit younger than Keynes, lived from 1899 to 1992. And he was from Austria, and he's part of this Austrian school of economics. He had a very different experience from Keynes. He grew up, and you have to imagine that if you were living in Austria when he was sort of your age, sort of 12, maybe 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, Austria was right in the middle of World War I. And when he came of age, when he left university, there, there was pretty bad economic climate in Vienna, bad economic climate um, throughout Austria, which, which certainly influenced his political and economic way of thinking because there was rampant inflation, prices were going up, and it was really hard for families to make it in Austria when he was, when he was trying to sort of get a job and get on with life. And so he actually moved to the UK in the 1920s, and he spent most, of, he spent the early part of his academic career at the London School of Economics. He eventually became a British subject, and his most famous work was his 1944 work, The Road to Serfdom, which we're going to talk about a bit. Now, it's really important 
that if we're going to be talking about Keynes and Hayek, that we know what it is that we mean when we're talking about the economy. So the economy, in its broadest sense, is the collection of all the individuals in a country that are doing work. They're producing things. So the baker making rolls, the farmer sowing wheats, the car manufacturing, you know, the Cowley factory in Oxford, even, even people who don't actually make anything but just provide services, these are all people who are working, these are all people who are producing things, and that's what we would refer to as the economic output or gross domestic product <coughs> of a country. All of your teachers, all of your parents, anybody who works is, is helping to contribute to the country's gross domestic product. It's a measurement of, of expenditure, it's a measurement of production, and importantly, it's a measure of income. When economists talk about boring things like GDP, what they really mean is they're saying, how, how much income does a country have? And the, the ways that this income is spent, people who want to, to have this production, um, typically you'd classify in four ways. You'd say that number one, we've got consumers. People like you and me, who just live their lives, have households, and you want to buy things to, to live your life. You know, you want to buy your school blazer, your, your breakfast, your um, um, anything that you do for leisure, anything that you need would be part of your household expenditure. Businesses also buy things from the economy. So businesses buy equipment, businesses buy stock, and they are also taking in, in some ways you can think that businesses are supplying this material, but they're also buying this material from the economy. The government, also buys things from the economy. The, the government wants to build roads, so they spend money and they employ people to build roads. The government needs to spend money on the military, so that's an, that, that's an issue of government expenditure. And also you could say that there is an external market for what we produce in the UK. People from abroad want to buy British goods and services. Now if we're talking about the economy in the long term, we would think, how is our income growing and to what extent is that growth sort of, how does that growth fluctuate over time? So economists often look at this idea of a business cycle, which puts economic growth on the <coughs> y-axis, which puts time on the x-axis, but they tend to see that when the economy grows, it doesn't just grow as, as a steady rate, it sort of has these sort of, I don't know, gyrations you could say. It has what you call expansion times, peak times, recession times, busts, and then the, the whole thing repeats itself again. And this is what the economists and business people refer to as the business cycle. Now this is what Keynes and Hayek were both very, very interested in coming up to the 1930s, because can anyone tell me what happened right at the beginning of the 1930s that would have made, you, that would have made an economist interested in the business cycle? Any ideas? Yeah? Absolutely. Well, the Great Depression in America, and I suppose you could say the Great Depression to the extent that it, that it spread around the world, and certainly here in the UK. So the Great Depression was basically an economic slump on a very, very large scale. It was a time when many people in the US and here in the UK could not find work. There was no work, there was no way that people could produce things that they wanted to produce to, to earn a living, to earn an income, to feed their families. And Keynes and Hayek both looked at this question because traditional economics would have said that if so many people were out of work, well then certainly the people who were in work would have lower wages and therefore the people who, um, who wanted work could just, as long as they accepted a lower wage, they could get back into work and the economy would be able to sort itself out. But this wasn't happening in the 1930s. And so economists and Keynes and Hayek both looked at this question to say, why is it that the economy is not sorting itself out? Keynes' view was that there needed to be a top-down solution. His view was that consumers and businesses weren't spending enough money in the economy to create the demand to get things rolling again. So his big solution was to get people to spend more and save less and to get the government to take a more active role in the economy by, by having expansionary fiscal policy, which means government spending. And his, his proposition was that it's a good idea for the government 
to just dig a ditch, pay someone to dig a ditch, and then have somebody else say, well, my job is going to be that I want you to fill that ditch in. His proposition was that would be a good thing because it would inject money into the economy and that would get things going again because those people will then take that money back and then they start to spend money on their households and businesses and so forth. Hayek's view was slightly different. His view was that the, the solution needed to be bottom up. He thought that the, the depression was not a problem with spending, was not a problem with the government spending too little, but he thought that if we spend all this money, actually it's going to pervert the incentives that people have. It's going to give people too much money, and it's going to make them think that they, they, they'll always have this money even in the good times. And his solution was actually, let's just wait this out. If you actually hold back, you won't actually create the kind of boom that leads to such a big bust in the first place. And we'll be better off in the long term just trying to slowly let ourselves work itself out. So the battle was set really in the 1930s between these two men and between their, their sets of friends. Kane, uh, John Maynard Keynes had this group of people in, at Cambridge University that were referred to as the circus. And he had all these sort of allies, basically, that would have these debates around the country. And Hayek was at the London School of Economics. And he had all of his sort of allies. And they would get together and they would debate these ideas. Keynes came out with a couple of books in, in this time. One of them was called A Treatise on Money which he brought out in, the 19th, uh, in 1930, which Hayek then reviewed and criticized and debated. Now, the big thing that really came was in 1936, Keynes came out with something called the General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. This, this work became essentially a revolution in the way that people think about economics, even to the extent that we talk about consumer spending and government spending and investment and GDP. All of that really comes from Keynes' book in 1936. So he produced this work. All these people from around the world sort of got into it and they said, yeah, that makes sense, and they started to promote it. And importantly, what started to happen is that government started to listen to Keynes. And particularly in the United States, um, Roosevelt and the New Deal, he basically saw this and said, this sounds like a brilliant idea. So let's actually take government spending policy, let's get people to work again, let's build some big amphitheaters in the US, let's build a bunch of dams in the Tennessee Valley so that we can have hydroelectricity for, for years to come. And so there's a big legacy in the US about this New Deal spending, which was very much a Keynesian idea of getting the economy going again by having the, the, the government inject money into the economy. And by the, end of the night, by the end of World War II, which if you want to think about it, fighting a war is very much a Keynesian idea, get the, get the government to spend lots and lots of money to get people to produce tanks and ships and planes to fight each other. Um, basically, Keynes was seen as having won the battle between the two of them, and a lot of his ideas were sort of accepted as, as, as true. And certainly by the time that he died in 1946, he was certainly seen to have, to have won the battle, and you could sort of look at the next several decades, the next three decades at least, as being the age of Keynes. Because what happened was, governments took his ideas of government spending and managing the economy and getting really involved and took it to some real great extremes. And so the examples I'm going to give are of American presidents. Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s, a Republican, a quote, conservative, wanted to be very, very careful with government spending, but yet he ramped up the American military and built a series of interstate road systems at tremendous expense which is pretty much a Keynesian idea. Get, get, governments, get, get, get the government to inject money into the economy. John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, did what now a lot of Republicans would do. Is one of his big policies was to have a massive tax cut. He had a tax cut for Americans, which basically meant that they had more money, the government had less money, but, but the, the <coughs> people who got the tax cut could then reinvest that into the economy and would make the economy go again. Um, Richard Nixon, another Republican, quote, conservative, really had a lot of Keynesian ideas, especially in election years. He was known to say, well, we'll spend some money, even if we don't have it, just to get the economy moving again, so that maybe I'll be a bit more popular so I can be reelected. And even Ronald Reagan, sort of this arch-conservative figure in American politics, had tax cuts and had massive public spending programs, usually, most, mostly on the military, 
which meant that there was lots of government money going into the economy that was helping to, 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 to shore up a, a, a big boost in the American economy in the 1980s. And all of these, you could say, in some ways, are Keynesian ideas, which meant that by the 1960s, when economists were discussing things, they basically said, we're all Keynesians now. All the ideas from the 1936 work um, have been accepted, and we'll just use those to make sure that we manage the economy. Through the 1940s, Hayek, Hayek produced this book, it's called The Road to Serfdom, which was very much sort of a, a warning against communism and totalitarianism, and basically saying that, you know, because his idea was to leave things alone, and he very much wanted to, to make sure that, that, pe that people understood that the economy would be better off if, you, if, if it was just left alone, if it was just left to its own devices, <coughs> and very much putting, a, putting the message out that we want to have government reduced in, in the economy. Um, in the late 1940s, he actually had to leave the, the UK because that book actually wasn't very well received by UK academics, but it was really, really well received by the American public, and the American public loved it. He also got a bit sad about the fact that Keynes had sort of won the battle. He had, a, he had his marriage broke down, um, ended up having a divorce. So he moved to the US and to the University of Chicago, where he was very much sort of celebrated as being this figure that would be, that would be seen to be um, sort of contrary to the Keynesian way of thinking that was very prevalent at that time. But eventually, he sort of ended up sort of in near obscurity. And by the 1960s, he actually moved back to Germany and was very much a forgotten figure. And nobody really knew about who, who, um, who Hayek was until the 1970s. Because in the 1970s, what happened is instead of having the type of growth that you would see in the business cycle, and when you have growth, you would expect price levels to rise because people are getting richer, they can afford to buy more. And in the 1970s, what was happening is the economy was actually not doing very well. The economy was actually starting to, to go down a bit, but price levels were, were rising. And Keynesian economics said that this couldn't happen. You couldn't have rising prices and falling output. And so people were starting to think, well, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the model that we're using. Maybe there's something wrong with the way that we're thinking. And people increasingly started to look back towards Hayek's ideas. Now, Hayek also had a disciple. His name was Milton Friedman. <coughs> Milton Friedman was this American economist who was very interested in Hayek's ideas, very interested in getting the government out of, out of the economy. And Hayek, Hayek and Friedman were very influential in, in promoting policy that would actually have the government be less involved in, in the US economy um, in particular. And, and, and Friedman and Hayek developed certain ideas called monetarism, which then sort of went away from state involvement, or so much state involvement in the economy, and started to have ideas of, of pulling back government spending and privatizing certain businesses. And it's very interesting because some of the, some of the followers of both Friedman and Hayek were in the 1980s. What sort of political revolution did we see both here in the United Kingdom and in the USA? Who, who came to power in the 1980s here in the UK? Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher and Hayek, she, she really identified with Hayek. Her background as a shopkeeper's daughter really reflected on this idea of let's get the government out of what we're doing, let's just be really frugal, and let's make sure that, that, that we work forward. So he, was a, he, so he came back out of obscurity from nowhere, long after Keynes was dead, and people were suddenly listening to Hayek again. And he would visit 10 Downing Street, and he would visit the White House, and he would, he would have these consultations on how the economy could actually be better off with actually less government rather than more. And it sparked off the debate again, and we've seen now since the 1980s, this debate about whether or not Hayek was right or Keynes was right, or, but generally the consensus was that Hayek was actually more right than Keynes, until something happened fairly recently. The financial crash, and what, and what, and what was the financial crash due to? Why, why, why did we have the financial crash? So, absolutely, and, and Ryan's done a little bit of research on this actually, quite a bit of research. But there was a housing bu bubble in the US because essentially the government was left to just say the housing market could just get on with itself. A lot of these sort of Hayek ideas of just let, um, let markets get on with themselves. And so this housing market bubble crashed, 
Suddenly, we saw the greatest recession since the Great Depression. And so all of a sudden, governments around the world, and especially in the US, and especially here in the UK, suddenly ran back to the Keynesian ideas. And in the UK, the first thing that they did in November 2008 was they said, we're going to pass a bill to have 20 billion pounds spent this year and next year to try to shore up the, the economy. Oh, thank so 20 billion to, 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 to shore up the UK economy, and nearly $1 trillion spent over three years in the USA. And so suddenly everyone's thinking, hey, hold on a minute. Um, you know, this, this Keynes was actually all right, wasn't he? Um, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing that we actually had government <coughs> managing, um, managing markets. And it's widely agreed now that, that this intervention pretty much helps prevent us have any kind of hope of having any sort of lifestyle now following this, the, the crash that we had in, in 2008. So the question that I leave for you now is sort of where do we go from here? Who was right and who was wrong? And it's difficult to say because depending on who you ask, you'll probably get a different answer. My personal view is that, pol is that politicians and commentators will say whatever is convenient for them. I think that if Keynes were alive today, he would come up with some new theory to try to explain the world, and it wouldn't necessarily conform to what he originally published in 1936. And it certainly wouldn't conform to some of the things that his followers in the age of Keynes then sort of invented on his behalf. And I think the interesting thing about this is that the political debates that are framed, whether or not that be with the 2008 crisis or the amount of government involvement in the economy or anything else, people often take these big thinkers and they try to say, well, here's what the distillation is for you to be able to, to have and consume when you're making your decision. But really, the actual thought that, that was put into it, I mean, Keynes was really just sort of an academic thinking I mean, he wanted to come up with solutions, but he was more interested in, I think, just pursuing the truth, and pursuing something that was interesting and original. And I can, and I can certainly say that Hayek was, was more interested in coming up with some really interesting ideas that wasn't necessarily to do with the actual economy itself. But if you, uh, the, the thing that I would recommend that you want to do, if you want to look into this anymore, there's some great books on the subject. One of them is called Keynes Hayek um, by Nicholas Watshaw. And it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It, it's a great narrative. It goes right through how everything happened, right through the, the development of the 30s, the aftermath, um, right up to the present day. Also, um, Robert uh, Sinelski um, is one of the great, is a great biographer of John Maynard Keynes. And he's got a new book out that's actually called Return of the Master, which talks about the economic influences of Keynes since the 2008 crisis. But before you do that, my real recommendation, the rap that you saw when you were coming in, these guys, I'm not sure exactly who they're affiliated with, but some people, and they've got several million views on YouTube, they've got a couple of different raps that they've come up with that explain the battle between Keynes and Hayek. Because since 2008, Hayek has become, and the, the, the difference between Keynes and Hayek has become much more mainstream in the media, you can find podcasts on this, you can find lots of news articles, but I think the most interesting and entertaining one is probably the YouTube clips, which have the raps. And if you actually listen to the raps, um, I actually have my upper six economists, um, lower six economists actually transcribe exactly what they say because it's so dense with information about the ideas that they had. Um, it's really, really very interesting. So thank you very much for attending this Spark Lecture. We will have several more over the course of the year. My aim as Master of Scholars is to organize one every half term. And I hope, well, and please let me know whether or not you found this interesting. If you didn't find it interesting, please let me know. That would be, that'd be very useful as well. But um, if you have any other questions, I'd love, to speak with this, um, I'd love to speak with you about this further. Are there any questions right now to begin? Yes? Um, you spoke about some Margaret Thatcher in relation to Kate. Um, and she very interestingly coined some notion about bad economics. How does that relate with his sort of philosophy of economics, and, and uh, or not relate? Um, uh, how that, yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. So the idea of trickle down economics, yeah. I believe, is to say that if you if you reduce tax rates on the rich people in the, in the economy, yeah. then they'll spend more money, and then that'll trickle down, and it'll make everybody else um, better off. And that was certainly something that, that Reagan championed, and certainly that you hear now, Donald Trump. 
and a lot of people would disagree with. So I think, I'm not sure if Hayek would have an opinion on that. Hayek would actually just say, let's make the tax system fair, um, and let's actually try to reduce the government as much as possible. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if Keynes had an opinion on it specifically, but some of Keynes' disciples, um, some of his sort of follow-on people, um, one of them actually had a, and, and, and his name is escaping me right now, but one of them actually said that basically, what, like, what are you saying? The, like, you know, how do we make the economy go? And trickle-down economics, according to, to Keynesians, is to say, well, the reason the economy is not moving is because the poor, the poor have too much, the rich have too little, so let's give the rich more, and therefore, and let's take away more from the poor, and that's going to sort the economy out, and that obviously doesn't work. And um, in fact, if, if you give me a minute, or maybe afterwards, I'll sit and think of exactly which Keynesian said that. But really great question. Yes, Tamer. Uh, that's a really good question. Am I a am I a Keynesian, or I guess would you say like like a neoliberal or a monetarist? I suppose. Uh, I think that the people I identify most with. I don't think I identify with Keynes specifically. Um, I try to keep. I, I try to t tend to keep an open mind. I think that the, what I like to look at is I like to look at someone like Milton Friedman, who is seen, sometimes seen as being very conservative, but actually when you look at his ideas, Milton Friedman I think was an extension of Keynes. He actually took Keynes' ideas and didn't didn't ditch them away, but actually said, I'm going to refine them. I'm going to actually say that you know we still need we still need the tools that Keynes gave us, but I'm going to do it with actually maybe another type of policy rather than just government spending. Anybody else?